I grew up in the UK, but my parents were originally from India, born in Africa, East Africa, Kenya. I started my career as an investment banker in London. So straight after university, I went into investment banking where I was doing large scale public M&A in, in Europe in the UK. From there, I moved to the Middle East where I was based out of the UAE, also doing M&A or UBS in the uh, Middle East and North Africa team. So spent a lot of time in Jordan, Saudi, as well as Qatar, raising money for companies as well as uh, deploying money in smaller private deals for the sovereign wealth funds in the region. And after that, uh, I'd always been quite entrepreneurial in nature. Uh, and I decided I wanted to move to Southeast Asia uh, in particular. Uh, so eventually start an internet business, but uh, I decided to first uh, join a company. So I joined the management team of a startup called NinjaVan. At the time, it was a Series B startup in Southeast Asia that does e-commerce logistics, like delivery in India, for example. And then I took them all the way up to their latest round, a Series E, basically. So they grew from a valuation of 200 million when I joined them to maybe somewhere around 2 billion as of today helped primarily in the partnerships team, expanding them across Southeast Asia. So spent a lot of time taking their business model from where it existed into new markets, including Indonesia and Thailand, setting up operations with their key partners. From there, there is an interesting journey of how I ended up in Uber Brands. Essentially, I took what I knew best, so M&A, and also my understanding of e-commerce in the Southeast Asia region having worked on the logistics side for all of the sellers. And there were very interesting companies in Europe and US raising from e-commerce aggregates a model. Essentially, Uno Brands is an e-commerce aggregate. So we buy smaller brands uh, from solo entrepreneurs uh, across the region, uh, and we aggregate them and put them onto our platform uh, to help them scale further from where they are to really grow them. Uh, post that, that's just a quick uh, overview of Uno Brands. And I took my learnings from NinjaVan and my M&A backgrounds to raise money for this business model. As of today, we've raised just over a hundred million to aggregate brands across the region. We have a couple of hundred staff based across six different markets. We did actually operate in India historically. We had a tech team there. Unfortunately, given the fundraising environment, although we've downscaled that since. Uh, and, and today we, we continue our mission of acquiring brands and adding them to the platform and scaling them from there. Um, so that's a little uh, background uh, about myself. I am knowledgeable in areas I would say M&A, if anyone's looking for fundraising advice and other knowledgeable, and that's based particularly on SEA and also from Kamala Mina India. I am knowledgeable about international expansion, especially around team launching into new countries and other. Uh, I've done that many times. And I would say anything related to consumer product and otherwise I've gone interested and, and should be able to answer questions. But generally any questions, I'm open, at least giving my understanding or my feedback as well. And hopefully it's helpful to you all. Yeah, Rishi, that's a quick intro about me and happy to take the conversation, which way the, the people on the call want to go. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kushal. Welcome to the mentorship session. We have a lot of founders here from our community and maybe we should just jump into questions right after this. So for everyone else on the call, maybe think about your biggest challenge and we can have those questions for Kushal. And starting off with questions on chat. So the first one is, what are the things that make pitch deck interesting for investors? How should the flow be for a pitch deck? Pitch deck for me, it has to be very concise. So I think the ones that are the worst are the ones that are, are super long, just too much information, the super concise. Yeah. Look, the way that I look at it is a very concise deck, simple introduction on who you are and what problem you're solving, the solutions you've built and why it's interesting. So the size of the market and why it is an actually interesting problem to solve, the team that is behind it, what are you requesting the money for? And basically direct contact to the CEO. People often forget that, but put it right there in, in the deck. Something as simple as that to me gets the ideas across uh, as it for, for a pitch deck. You don't need too much more than that. In fact, if I look back in our preliminary decks, I see much a lot of founders with much better decks than we had. We just had a good idea and we explained that idea very simply. We're going to acquire brands for very cheap multiples and aggregate them together and help them scale from that. It was as simple as that. So don't overcomplicate the problem as well. We could have written a million more things of how we're going to structure the debt for our acquisitions, what exactly we're going to do, but we just kept it very simple initially. Uh, and those who like the idea, 
However, that being said, I know there are some technical ideas out there in the group and it needs a bit more explanation to get people on board. Typically, the VCs that are interested in your type of business model will already know what you're talking about. That's why I think it's more of a keep it simple student situation uh, of elaborate. I guess people are interested in knowing your journey through your first seed funding. Yeah, that, that's a, actually an interesting question. So I started, I wouldn't say young, but in my co-founding team, I'm actually very young. And as a surprise, out of all my co-founders, I knew none of them before I started. I never met them. We had no connection. But people often ask how, how, when they look at us, how did we get together as a team? Essentially, I was fundraising for this business model independent by myself. And I was meeting up with my connection primarily back in Europe. And one of those investors was Rocket Internet. I'm sure some of you may be familiar. So essentially, we're meeting with Rocket Internet. We're doing an IC with them. And essentially, they like the business model. So I found us to the business model, primarily my M&A background, and secondly, in my knowledge of e-commerce standards. So there was a founder set to the business model. They liked the business model, so they had already researched and knew about it, which is why I said I didn't have to explain so much. It was quite obvious in that sense. They already knew a lot about what I was doing. And what they said is essentially that they wanted to fund me. They wanted to fund me for that business model. And then a couple of days later, they called me back and said they had seen another founder from the same region, so both in Singapore, wanting to do the same business model. And he was uh, much older than me, a bit more experienced. He's a third time founder, actually. So he founded initially Food Food Panda, it's the largest food delivery, standalone food delivery company in the region. So he was the founder of that. And then another startup called Zen Rooms. It's like Oyo Rooms, but Southeast Asia version. So he was two time founder, Kira, and this was his third startup. He was also interested in this business model. And both of those companies were also historically rocket funded. So they knew him as well. And they said, hey, you guys have great, great complementarity, essentially. And they put us together. Uh, and we met. So I flew back. I was actually in the Middle East at the time uh, doing fundraising. I flew back to Singapore during COVID lockdown. Did two weeks of quarantine in Singapore. And the first date outside of quarantine, I met Kira, essentially my, one of my co-founders. And we clicked. We're both from the same area of India, historically, Gujarat. We had a lot in common. He's more older, senior. I had a lot of M&A experience. We found a fit in that you've done fundraising many times. I was sure of the assets we were going to buy at the start. We just clicked. And from that conversation, we decided to build out a bit more of a co-founding team. So from there, we started looking for our founders, but with his expertise as well, and with Rocket Internet, the business model was actually quite hot. And with him being a seasoned founder, essentially. There was a lot of interest in us and we just gathered angels from our own network. For example, one of the tickets into Uno Brands was from my old boss at Ninja Bank. Obviously their series D company at the time they had taken some secondary and I had convinced him to put in uh, angel money into us. Uh, same from some of the other co-founders. We gathered a small angel network uh, and also Rocket Internet. They bought a couple of uh, additional friends, essentially funds that they work with closely and said, here's a good business model. And that's how we got our, our seed round together. The interesting part of our business model is that our seed money was quite large. It was 40 million USD. Only $5 million of it was equity. The rest of it was debt. And we basically took out a venture debt facility uh, right at the start. It was more attractive back then, the interest rates and other, so I'm not recommending it for others. But because of our particular business model, acquiring hard assets. So we also explored very early on venture debt and potentially even these days, given rounds are smaller, more tight. If you need some venture debt to pop up your rounds, there are ways to get that money as well. Yeah. I think a supporting question to this is what do investors seek during the seed stage? It may have got tougher since we raised because the, the barriers are a bit more invention and people wanting to see a little bit more back in, let's say the peak of 2020, 2021, the, the bubble was actually a, a venture in the region. People could raise pre-product, pre-revenue, pre-everything. These days, I think it's a little bit tougher. Uh, Rob may have some opinions on this as well. Um, but these days I, I feel slightly tougher in that people want a cohesive idea that makes sense, a team that is the right people to execute on it and potentially even a little bit of traction. So some initial feedback from users, you've made some effort to start, but back in 2020, 2021, maybe 2019 in that bubble, some companies were raising, uh, and even us, 
we raised off the idea, primarily because of our type of business model. Again, I, it's very different to, let's say, SaaS, B2B SaaS or B2C SaaS tools, where ours was basically we are acquiring brands that already exist, putting them together and building a platform. It's a very different type of startup, almost akin to a PE house, but there are several examples in India of similar players, Mensa, Global Bees, Go. In fact, Go just raised again yesterday. I'm not sure if anyone saw that, but it does show that there's still fundraising going around in, in the Indian market as well. That's pretty interesting. So another person asks, I have a unique idea to solve daily problems or busy individuals. I have created a website and my app development is underway. What is a good point to approach investors and how should I approach them? Since we don't have any traction on the market right now, but have conducted the research required. Yeah. So with these, and I think what Rob is building with Athena is really great because it gets you um, that start point that you need. A lot of people find this challenge of fundraising and a lot of you guys are the builders products, right? Fundraising is an art, in the, but the ways that I look at it and the ways that I've historically uh, done it is being part of the angel network or within the startup scene, at least going to all these events and, and networking my way like that. I find the people that are interested in similar ideas and I build, I would build it by angels. Basically you can uh, inbound yourself to VCs knowing, so just cold email them even better if you can get a warm introduction. To VCs, I think that's helpful. Find another founder that's in your area of India or in your similar space that has connection to a startup that's already raised. Ask them, I'm sure they would. Like, has anyone asked me for connections if they were building a business in Indonesia or one of our investors was useful? If I think it's a good idea or a good fit for them, I would provide the water introduction. Angel networks, don't underestimate them as well. There are just uh, people or, or networks uh, across India and even in Southeast Asia that are interested in looking and hearing more about ideas that are usually point people for these and they're willing to listen. I know of a couple in Southeast Asia that I'm part of, and at least the people that manage those work take an introduction call to hear about your idea to see if it's worth bringing to, to the group. I would say a little bit as well, for, while you're building that traction, I know money is, is a gating item for a lot of people to really push further, but I know a lot of people that can build something on very low capital as well, like uh, just after work or on the side of something until you find that uh, relevant party to invest as well. So don't give up just because no one is, is giving the money yet. Keep building what you can with the limited capital that's available. Cool. All right. Actually, for, for context, even for six months, we were... The first, sorry, five months, we were unfunded. So we ran just, I, so I, I used to work basically nine till six at my previous company, Ninjavan, and then I would work the evening on Una Brands, unpaid. Um, also, I needed a visa for Singapore, which, because we didn't have the license entity and things like that, I had to do both for a long period of time. So it's not, the start is not always easy, I feel. It, it looks super easy once all the money is there. You get HR person and find out it looks like a normal company thereafter. But honestly, the start can just be as messy as we used to meet in a cafe in the evenings and the work. That, that was it. From the idea. We have another question where the person asks, we have one product in development with the MVP ready. How do we approach a VC if we have multiple ideas or plans? Do we do it in the same pitch deck? Do we use multiple pitch decks? Do we do multiple meetings? How should they go about it? Yeah, actually, this is probably a one where you need a bit of background on it. So I don't know who asked this question, but maybe we can get a quick introduction on the ideas as well. Uh, hi, Kushal. I'm uh, trying to build a uh, democrat democratically trending news app. So we already have a product, but uh, we are suffering with a cold start. So we cannot have trending news without a lot of people. And without a lot of people, we cannot create organic trends. So uh, I would appreciate uh, your thoughts on any of the such cold start problems. Yeah, I'll give some context oh. to that and oh, yeah. uh, some background. I'll add some background to it. So I am a game developer. I've been working for the last six years, mostly on a job. So on the side, I work on my own game. So I have a bigger team now, uh, a team of five, and we all work on these games. Over the last two months, I split that team into two. 
So uh, what I'm not sure is if I'm approaching a publisher or an investor, better to teach both of those together as uh, uh, Yeah, please continue, please. Is it better to group everything together or is it better to have individual teachers for these individual games or let's be games a uh, product in any context we can answer? Okay, I, I give you my feeling, but I think there's two ways uh, around this one. So my personal view on this is that you should be very concentrated on one thing and basically pitch one thing so you're very clear. If that fails, then there's always the, hey, there's also this one. Like, uh, we, uh, we also like, and to see if there is, but there should be one that's the primary, basically, in my view, if you're going to try and get money from it, the one that you're already working on. Now, that's a generalized comment, I feel, because games is something very different. So I'm building a SaaS product and we've got this SaaS product and then this other one that we might work on games. I could see like a house of games or similar to that we've done. We have many grants, for example. It's not as binary as other business models. We have multiple brands, like consumer brands that we sell. You theoretically could build a house games and in, in, in that sense of development now. So it's in a generalized piece of advice, I would say for most people on average, if you're going to a VC, it's easier to basically give them one solid idea that you've got and very well developed, concise deck on. If you try and put two things in that, you may lose them. But there's also this idea it seems a bit weaker to me. That's my gut feeling on your problem. Go with one, if you're trying to raise money. That being said, as a caveat, games potentially could give multiple ideas to, if you're raising. Thanks. Actually, have you ever considered Basil, just a house of games or, or something like that, or you just develop games ad hoc? What type of games are they? And the two projects we had ongoing is one is like a more hyper casual approach to it, where we have to go to publishers. And the other is a more games, which targets a niche set of players. Okay. Uh, one, one way you could really do it is the same as in a brand. So essentially you're fundraising at the top code a game developer house. The products yes. you put underneath them, you can just do whatever you want. So actually you could raise it up and go, Hey, I'm developing, I'm raising money because I'm building this, this a couple of our initial ideas for games are X and Y. And then you could potentially get away with pitching multiple in one to give them a flavor of here's the type of games we thought about and development, and et cetera, et cetera. So that could also work. Actually, I think that might be even better in, in some sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to do that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks. Have you ever thought about acquiring games as well? Like a game, uh, stuff? how many of them are in India and things like that? Are there games that do well? It's, it's my area of expertise, basically. So I, in some angle, feel like you could buy up these small indie game houses or game developers and roll them up together. Yes. Yeah, like so run. developers that I work with, so it is mostly the developers that I collected along the way. So most of them are friends and all of them are up to like game developers have this passion for making indie games. They always want to do something on their own. So really easy to find people with that right passion. It's always easy to find a lot of people who share that same passion to make these indie games. And this you that as well. Let's say one of the games or indie developers creates a game. What's the kind of revenue it generates monthly? And what's the maintenance cost for just keeping it alive for these small indie games? Yeah, so it really depends on this revenue part really depends on games you're making. There's games that like if you're targeting hyper casual games, we usually go with the publisher route instead of the investor route, where we get a different payment from the publisher for that game and they run ads for the game. Most of the revenues and these publishers offer up to uh, 200k upfront payment, but their KPIs are uh, really hard to hit. In terms of normal games, I actually have my uh, business partner here on the call with me. Nub, uh, if you are listening to this, can you give some insight about that revenue part? Or not? Hi guys. So right now, with respect to revenue, it depends on the type of game that we are building. Hmm. In our case, we are mostly looking into adding some roguelike elements to existing games. You can consider games like a Teen Patti game or a poker game, where you are basically following, uh, apart from the typical rules, you might envision at one point that what if I had this particular power up, which can basically benefit you. So we wanted to add some roguelike elements to our games, but primarily from a revenue standpoint, if I talk about a top grossing game, if I take Team Patti Goals example, which is one of the highest grossing games in India, they make 
a very good revenue in terms of weekly. It's about 50k dollars a week. So our genre is mostly into card games as of now. The project that I am in. So well, yes, that, that's so a, last, that's very helpful. The reason I was asking is obviously you're developing these games. That's great in the grand scheme of things. Collecting these indie people and bringing them into a bigger collective. That can only be a good thing for it because well, you have more of these games that you push out and your revenues are distributed across them. So if you don't have some, that's okay, but you've got other games to do support. You can build a nice company out. Uh, and our model is essentially that. So we look at these brands, small brand houses, solo entrepreneurs as well, like call it indie. Yeah. It's the same as the indie game. Account, but it's just a solo entrepreneur that builds a consumer brand. We, yeah. we find them. We go, look, you built this. It's great. Let's give you some money for it. It's not going to be like a huge exit uh, in, in the sense, but they get some money for it. We take on that brand. Uh, and then we sometimes even bring them on into our group and say, look, here's some money, build a new one. And then just get filled that way. We got the revenue from the old one. They're building a new one for us and, and we build our team like that. So I think that's a super interesting business model in, in you guys. Yeah, hopefully the games work out and you can create some winners in that. Chad. Yeah, and, and FYI, you can also raise debt for these games in India, private credits taking off. And if you're buying an asset that generates EBITDA already, I, or generates profit, let's just put it that way, people will be interested in lending you money to buy, basically. Uh, so a question uh, regarding this is, we, like I come from a product background. Uh, I basically struggle to understand how a gaming pitch deck would look like because we are not actually solving a problem here we are actually making our players play game so that question should i think investor would ask why should they play your game exactly um, is there any reference that you can give us so that we can research a bit where we can at least we can mm -hmm. cover these aspects let's say tomorrow if we are pitching this idea to athena bc Honestly, so we got the top one. I, I get your point. Like a game, and also it's in the eyes of the user as well. Sometimes VC is not going to be the end user of your casual game as well. So I, I do get your point. Like games, they're naturally more creative item. Someone's not going to be easily able to tell if the user is going to play it or not, but if it has an interesting concept. What I think you can use though, is the metrics of similar games to get people on board. Because you already told me, you told me this top grossing grade does 50K weekly and on the profit of that. And you can try to use those metrics to get people to understand it a little bit more, I think. Secondly, you go with the original uh, thing that I said, which is forget about your game house, try and pitch your top level. So you develop games and here's your historical track record on XYZ games and you need money for this new game. So give a little bit of past track record on games that you've built. It's a little bit different to other pitch decks. And also what I mentioned right at the beginning is quite a standardized answer of like, what solution are you solving? I don't think that's the right one for your small indie games. Actually, I think you can go a little bit more ad hoc and just say, look, here's an example of a historical game that we've built. These are the metrics of it. We've got these new ideas, which we're fundraising for, so we can build up these. Yeah. Um, that would get me interested. And here's the concept of the game and why it's interesting and other competitors that have done similar things that do well. Understood. Thank that's, you. that's my best input on that. Games is an interesting niche that I'm interested in. It's very similar to consumer brands in some sense, but also very different. Understood. Thank you. All right. Maybe take some questions from people. Like that I see that you've raised your hand. Would you like to start with your question? Uh, yeah, I have a little question. No, the bank. Details. Little question. Just one second. Let's take an order queue first. Oh, if Victor has a question, we go ahead. Victor, if you're not on the call, we'll move on to Mohit. Hi, Kushal. Hi, Mohit. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Kushal, you work uh, with D2C brands. Uh, I searched about Yuna brands right now. It's similar to, or might be, there are many other brands like them, like Mensa in India. I guess if I'm not wrong. So I'm also building something similar uh, related to online shopping and service. Uh, it's a decentralized super app where we are connecting multiple online D2C stores, one place to provide them a decentralized unified shopping experience. So I have completed the uh, product and we did it and we did the beta testing and already have 42 users last week. 
So my question is, uh, do you really think uh, customer acquisition cost is a problem uh, for D2C brands, especially just who are just operating on website? I was just asking, according to my research, customer acquisition cost and uh, uh, lifetime value are the challenges faced by more D2C brands. Yeah. So do you think this is the real problem which I'm solving? It is a big problem uh, and it's got worse over time, actually. So because so after COVID, uh, what I found is the customer acquisition cost, even on meta ads, is going high. Correct. Yeah. It's just become a lot harder to spend wisely for D2C brands. It's become a lot harder to acquire customers as well. A lot more competition and other driving that and just clicks costing more. So I think what you're building is useful. Could you go back to the product, the exact product you're building? Just uh, detail it out again. So basically what I'm building is uh, it's a decentralized super app where user can uh, do shopping by loss. I can order food like it's a uh, all-in-one app. But what we are providing is we provide, uh, uh, we are connecting stores directly. The user can shop from multiple website, app or cab booking or any other services like food, delivery, grocery using one single ID. Okay, I got it. So basically... They log in through your app and then suddenly they will be able to work their way through onto a, a random D2C, all sure. of the medicine brands, for example, yeah, yeah. love their D2C store, yep. and somehow connected them into yours so they can order the product from your app and you just keep yeah, adding they more, don't and more. Need to, They don't need to log in on multiple websites or to create a new account or to enter their payment details and it will be easy, more easy for them to track their orders as well. Uh, because many d brands don't provide a real-time tracking facility on their website. Okay, so it's quite interesting. There's a, a player called Open Store. They're, they're trying out concepts similar. So, and, and a few other aggregators like you know, brands as well, the ones in Europe with uh, a, a lot more brands, they've tried to do this, but they're not doing it via Supergrap. They're doing it via all-in-one kind of like .com, like a, a .com basically for all of the brands. So they bring all their brands onto one .com. I'm not... I'm not 100% set on it. I think people will go to it, but only if there's bundling or discounting or something that can be achieved across all of the brands. Sometimes people like, you lose a little bit of the brand story and other when you like just import the products on yours. And for D2C in particular, people like going, oh, I like a little bit. So I want to see a bit of the brand story. Unless it's like a repeat purchase uh, product. That may be one of the problems that you uh, face. But the best like, part is uh, the user uh, get the same price and same discount and same coupon. Okay, so all the coupons match and everything. Okay, so yeah. you have all of the bundling. Now, the, the thing that will ultimately sell me on using your app is if I could buy one product from one D2C store and another from another D2C store, but you also give me some sort of bundled discount. Yeah, I'd like to about, like obviously we, are, we have to work more about the user, how we will retain our users. The best part for the brands is the customer acquisition, zero customer acquisition cost, but we are doing the marketing and the second is lifetime value. Like when the people add any product on through your website or they forget about it and to reach them again, you have to retarget them using retargeting them. Oh, it's a it's an interesting uh, idea. I think you will have a load of, uh, at least on the seller side, all the brands will for sure. Yes, brand in last, any brands in the last twenty days. Yeah, yeah. I don't think brand is the issue. Brands, you will have a hundred if you want, two hundred, five hundred that will list uh, automatically. It's just making sure that the customer journey is, is good and that there are some benefits to buying from your through your apps uh, versus buying from the deep city store direct. But okay. I, I think it's a valid idea with the right execution. You could, somewhat, especially for the market in India, like you should concentrate geographically, probably. Yeah. Right, we are already focusing in India and top five, five metro cities. Exactly. Makes sense. So top five metro cities. And the other thing is just getting people to, because it's a super app, right? And just keeping them in your app, basically. So shop yes. with one thing, but what else do you keep them we in? We are not taking every industry uh, simultaneously. We have divided our app development in five parts. First is shopping. Second will be grocery. They will tie up with grocery brands. Then third will be food delivery. Fourth with the rest of uh, other services. Makes sense. Logical. Okay. Thank you. I, I might connect with you after as yeah. well, just to uh, get a sense of what you're building. Yeah, I, I send you the request on LinkedIn. Uh. Okay. We'll, we'll chat just to see. Obviously, we don't have, as Una Brands, we don't have anything in India, but I do have a lot of deep sea friends in India, potentially. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll see Kaushik is next in the queue. Would you like to go? I'd like to. Thank you. I'm to build a, a very public uh, direct to customer 
Twitter for news. It's going to be a news app. And my USP for uh, this particular app is people can consume democratically trending news. So we have come up with very fair algorithms and product and everything. But the moment of launching, we are getting a problem of uh, cold start. So unless we have a sizable number of users, we cannot have trending news. And uh, till we have trending news, we don't have anything to sell to this. So we are stuck with the launching point and not confident to launch it. Rob, are you still on the call as well? Yeah, yeah. There's a startup that I think we, I'm not sure we discussed it before, but it was Artifact. It's the X instagram co-founders uh, startup it sounds very similar to, to this and i think they had the exact same problem i'm not sure if it was us discussing this or uh and, and Koshik, do you know artifact no i'll check it out later Ar Ar artifact was similar it's is basically that it were kevin and mike from instagram they okay. after they sold instagram they decided that they wanted to do an ai driven uh, news app or oh, similar to you they're kind of pushes up the most democratically trending stuff and, and got rid of it. But they actually said the exact same thing. I think I was listening to a podcast recently and, and they ran into the same trouble of not getting enough user. I, I'm actually not sure on this one. It's, it's a tough question for me. Let's break it down into parts. So let's go through the problem again and let's see if we can make it into a, a smaller problem. First. So, so it's a, a classic cold start problem. So our app won't have anything of value to offer unless we have a sizable users. For our mm -hmm. algorithm to work and kick in, I need at least uh, 1,000 to 5,000 users actively using. And I cannot get users till I find, till they see something valuable in the product. So I cannot advertise as of now. Okay. To me, one it's... of the solutions I have, I'll tell you, but I'm a little not confident behind uh, pursuing that. So one of my mentors uh, suggested me to use a false door or to fake the trend till you get the people. And once you get the people, then get the, then remove your uh, fake, uh, uh, but that is like morally compromising. I, I feel, yeah, by the way, I wouldn't do that because there's other ones that did this. I think Aura Ring at some point did this where they didn't have the right heat data calculations or whatever. And then they said it was correct. And then they lost a ton of users. If you do that, you're morally compromised in my opinion. So I exactly. wouldn't fake the data, but what I would do is you're going to need to find basically 500 friends or, or a community that is going to help you build this for free by just saying, Hey, I'm going to use this app. And that's going to be hard to do, but I think the startup community in India is big enough. And even in Southeast Asia, like me, Rob, whatever can help you test your product and things like that. You're going to need to get basically 500, a thousand beta tested that are going to be able to use it probably lightly at the beginning, just to get the engine running, to give that feedback. Now, how do you get the problem to me that is, how do you get that initial 1000? There's literally 42 people on this call. So that's one chunk. So when it, so you could build it into smaller chunks and I'm sure that within the communities in India, that you should be able to get friends and family basically onto it just to get that engine running. And that's how we do it, by the way, with our D2C brands as well, or actually just bit, right, on Amazon, typically Amazon sellers, but your product is out there. The review count is the most important thing for, or for us, but how do you get that first review on Amazon? It's always through us going, Hey, Rob, can you buy my product to boom and give us a, a, a quick rating on it? And, and that, that starts the engine. And once that engine starts, more and more people will join that. Trip. So potentially that's the cold start solution you need. Have you tried that currently trying to get? Yeah. Uh, so I have uh, made a WhatsApp group and trying to gather people in that. Is that potential? Any benefit for beta testers as well? I think back to the old school crowdfunding scenarios where, you know, oh, if you're part of the first 1000, we'll give you a discount to the long-term membership anyway, or you're going to get it for free forever or some, something like that. I don't know. But no, here we cannot charge for any of the apps. Most of the apps won't work if you're charged. So we want to go with that based uh, revenue. So I cannot oh. give anything for, because it's always free. Got it, makes sense to the easier one. Which was you know, good to study how BuzzStream started, where they basically just aggregate like the most viral and interesting content, and then they repost it through their accounts and the same social media platforms, and then they get traffic. So you can all bootstrap it that way just by breaking existing like funding social media content. You can take a look at YPE.com where they just scrape. You can get a download of basically every course from LinkedIn, every course on Twitter, Facebook, etc. 
and you can create your algorithms on that. On. So I'm already scraping news off the internet as of now. I'm only worried about uh, people pushing that, boosting that and creating trends. So I have the news, but I don't have organic trends. But thank you guys. Like I'll uh, check both Artifacts and Busstream, both their stories and uh, how they've built their company. Yeah, there is definitely some podcasts on Artifact. Uh, maybe 20 VC did one a while back, Harry Stubbings. He definitely went through uh, with the founders and they were explaining what they found difficult about that journey. There's a slightly different to you. Now that I, I reread it, theirs was an AI driven engine. Yours is a democratic engine, basically saying the users pick what's interesting to the user yeah. rather than you know, either picking what's interesting for you. Yeah. Yeah. So a slightly Actually, different. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you, I, I'm not sure who's next. All right. Next in the queue is trick one. Are you there? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Aryan. Yeah. I have a, I have just a, a short little question. Uh, you've said uh, that we need to get into contact with VCs and the uh, winter. So how do we get into those networks? Uh, where we can find those? Which city are you based in, in India? Just uh, for my knowledge as well. Which city are you based in, in, in India? Sorry, I'm from uh, Kolkata right now. Oh, Kolkata, okay. Most tier one cities in India, or major cities in India have a entrepreneurship startup scene, it feels. And I always find like attending the events, meeting other like-minded as is the best way to get started. And then from there, your network will expand um, from that sense. So I don't know, maybe an example is that me and Rob once a month, we meet up. We have a small group of founders in Southeast Asia that we, we just meet up with. But whenever we have problems, especially on fundraising or others, we're just meeting up and linking to other people that we think could be useful for each other. So doing it by yourself, yeah, it's very hard. But I'm sure there are like-minded individuals in Kolkata, Chennai, Mumbai, Bangalore for sure. When they... Do you know any online uh, sites or uh, any platform like that? Okay. Uh, Rob, do you know the SAS one? It's SAS Boomi, right? Or, uh, yeah, the, the SAS Boomi, I, I use intro.co a lot where I just book like intros. Um, there's ADP lists as well, um, where you can book calls. There's definitely a few of them. So I'm hugely aware of the ones in India. Usually they are actually localized by geography, India, or even sometimes by sub city as well. So they're not, it's hard for me to comment exactly on that. But if anyone else on the group knows any or any of the cities in India, maybe just post it in the chat and that would be quite helpful. The one that I do know, or at least the one that's known in Southeast Asia, Sas Bumi, that's, that's actually, I've heard is quite a good one, but yeah, please uh, reach out to Rishi as well and, and Rob uh, after and I'm sure if there's a WhatsApp group for all the founders, we can uh, just post it. Uh, yeah, examples. That, that helps a lot. The next one, I see Arjun. Next, thank you. Hi, so I have bootstrapped uh, cloud computing. So there's a lot of investments right now happening with the data center series. So every gamble with the data center will be the operation area. So we are hosted on the second floor. AWS is hosted on the fourth floor. So is there a little experience in your, when you're building your companies and adjacent industry is growing and how you use that growth. Actually, uh, I wasn't able to fully hear the question. Rishi, I'm not sure if you got it either or if not. So can you repeat again, but just slightly louder or I'll move the mic. Okay. I guess the question was, how do we try to weave if we have even in similar industries, raising funds in the market, allowing funds in that specific space. Oh, yeah. Okay. Tag along. Correct me if I'm wrong, Arjun. Did I get the question right? It, it, it did sound like it. Not, not for raising money, but actually using that growth. What they have. Also, I'm in the cloud computing market and there's this data center. People are investing in the real estate and and I'm investing on the software and hardware side. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying actually now. And actually, I think it's actually the smartest thing that I learned uh, as well. I'll give, uh, I'll repeat back the question, but from my understanding as well. So there's always this main industry that's happening. 
you're saying you want to ride that wave by being a periphery service or something around it. Is, is that correct? But what I've noticed is this industry is mostly, what do you say, has an understanding about the interest, about real estate. They don't know actually how to build software. So AWS is the company which does all the software. AWS yeah, right. like rents out the core location basis from what is. So everyone's right now side-eyed and just investing in that space. But in future, you need that kind of capacity from software providers also to use that in certainty after five years or six years. Yeah. I um, roughly understand where you're going with it. What's the primary question? How do you benefit? How do you create? Exactly. Have you had to see some kind of say next three days? You know, that something's growing on the side and you are right in no, but I can give an example of how it could apply to our industry. So back in the day, maybe four years ago, there was a lot of fundraising happening for this business model of Uda Brands e-commerce aggregator. And you would have seen it in India for sure with Mensa being like the fastest ever billion dollar company of all time, blah, blah, blah. There was maybe even seven or eight competitors of Mensa. Yeah, there was just a ton of money going into the primary business model. The primary business model was e-commerce aggregates. And because that industry was growing so fast, there was so much capital pumped into it. Everyone was thinking, hey, I'm going to be the primary business model. We were like, oh, I want to launch Uno Brands and be the, the operator of this business model for Southeast Asia. But another way around it could have been, hey, I'm going to provide services to Mensa and they're going to pay me for those services because they're going to grow so quick. They're going to need that. So there's a few services that come to mind. One is they were buying brands. So there were also a ton of very smart people that said, hey, I'm going to broker the deals. So I'm going to find the D2C brands and go, hey, Mensa, I've got a menu of five brands you can buy. And when you buy them from me, you pay me commission on, on the deal. It's just like a service on, on the side. So it was very smart because Mensa had the money. They didn't have the time to find all of the brands. And they would just, because it's just SV only, they went to that. The second one that I saw a lot of was adjacent to used e-commerce. So 3PLs, so third-party logistics and or e-commerce enablers in India. Mensa, because it grew so quickly, started using these guys on just service retainers because they needed to. So you didn't have to be the primary industry to benefit it. You just got to see the, where the money is going and figure out how does your service fit to them and be the first one to go, hey, X company that's raised money, we can do this for you. Do you want to, the same thing happens with all the SaaS tools you go to the ones raised, but let's say you're a bigger part, you're for e-commerce, it's third party logistics, it's marketing agencies, it's, you know, or brokers selling the brands. These were big adjacent industries that took a huge success off the primary vertical of e-commerce aggregators. So if it does work. I'm not able to comment exactly on kind of infrastructure and uh, cloud compute, but it will work the same in all industries. There's always like the principal and then surrounding services that are making money off the, the primary, especially after big fundraisers in certain industries as well. It's just very obvious to, to go after it. The, the next one would obviously be AI. There's tons of money. If you are an AI service, I've even seen uh, people making uh, AI um, lectures, like bringing like organizations on how to put prompts on chat GPT. These courses go for 10 grand a session, one hour session, one person, 10K. Uh, you can make money just doing that uh, these days because it's around the vertical is AI and just services around that. Teaching people to use it, how to implement it in your organization. These kind of businesses will make money for sure in the next one, two years till it becomes more well-known than everyone. All right. Uh, the next one in queue is Stage. Could you maybe start with your question? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Hello, Gushal. This is Tejas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've started a marketing brand, no, not a merchandise brand, which is basically catering to all the brands in India and abroad where we manufacture and market the clothes. Oh. It's either clothes. Yeah. So have you, do you have an idea about sold store in any case? Yeah. Ah, nice. That's amazing. Thank you so much. This is, this is really great. So basically, Soul Store is a place where they have their own in-house designers, right? Instead of that, I am making it a marketplace where 
I want designers across the world to design across the world, which means I want to I want someone from Australia to design for India. I want someone from India to design from for Australia. Yeah. So that is the something that is something that I am building right now. We are the beta stage, and I wanted to understand what do you think investors say. Someone, someone who has raised series funds, someone like investors who have who have really big money. What do they look for? What do they look for? Because this is an idea which is not present elsewhere. I understand that Zazzl and a company, I'm not sure about the other company's name. Zazzl is a company which uh, does that what we do, but they don't focus exactly for the designers. What I'm saying is that we focus for designers and brands in such a way that they can collaborate easily and their products are marketed really well for the customers. Yeah. So, that is something we are working on. And I wanted to understand what are your thoughts about that? What is your thoughts about merchandise? What is your thoughts about apparel, clothing, accessories? Okay, so I'll give you some baselines on all of these points. I understand the business and this is actually more in line with what I know best. So you have got a, you do merchandising, basically means customization on, yeah. on the things. Your main SKUs are clothing. Yeah. But you allow designers to come up with any design and people can pick that design and print it onto the clothes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things, I think interesting one. So merchandising customizations is quite unique. It's hard to copy. E-commerce is becoming extremely hard because it's just a price race on most items and it's True. going basically back to the factory, but customization is not something that most people can do by the way. So it's most, very cool. so I think you've got some defensibility, a good area to target. Oh, nah, thank you so much. This gives me confidence. This literally gives me confidence so much no, that I, I can continue forward. We, we, by the way, we're looking at uh, doing similar stuff for us, but in, in China. Oh, my God. We, we do our products, but we offer customization from the user saying, hey, they want to write their name onto the, the cup that we sell and we uh, laser yeah. engrave it on. So not your type of customizations where it's a designer designing something, but just basic. But secondly, close is an interesting one. I would say that potentially you should look at other products as well, other SKUs, mugs, and all this type of stuff, awesome. because it is easier to manage the SKUs clothing. You've got different cool. sizes, different SKUs in, to manage, and your inventory turnover may, may be a bit longer. Your returns may be a bit higher, different size, don't fit, blah, blah, blah. If you offer that on customized products. Which Definitely. I we are so... I li like to give you a little more context so that I can little understand what you think about this. So we have around 60 products right now, which can be customizable by the designers. We are currently also working on the beta version, which will be released tomorrow. That is something. And we have trademarked something called design, DZYM. That is our trademark brand logo. So that I think that can work out really well. And apart from that, we also are talking to lots of production companies. You, yeah. Do you guys like cinema? Anyone like cinema? Uh, Kushal, do you like cinema? I uh, love the cinema, yeah. Cinema, anime, web series, all those people. We are talking to them. We are currently in talks with eight YouTube creators and two film producers. Or licensed designers or whatever. Let's say exactly. We are trying to get exclusive things so that we just want to be ourselves and we, we don't want anyone else to recreate our designs. So you that is the case. Uh, manufacturers, your work. Do you have in-house manufacturing in India or are you using a third-party manufacturer? So the manufacturer currently is my friend right now. I am Rich. looking to create my own in maybe six to eight months. That's my timeline. That's what I'm looking at. What do you think about this? Did yeah. So manufacturing is going to become hugely important. I'm not sure if you're deeply into the e-commerce scene yet, but essentially, so I operate in China. Actually, for most of the month, I live and work out of China today. I'm in Singapore, but okay. if you're deep into the manufacturing scene, and e-com scene, what's happening is if I could, I'm trying to visualize this on screen, but it's hard. There's like real true brands like L'Oreal, I don't know, can't see luxury brands um, yeah. brands and these things, but you can think of even like base, like high-end brands that people recognize every day, Nike or whatever. Yeah. Then there's the factory, like literally white label, cheap products from China or India. There's a ton of people operating somewhere in the middle. Got these third-party brands, whatever Mensa has bought it. You know, I the understand. The, the white-label product slaps a label on it. Got it. The brand X, 
and sells it at a premium. What's happening these days is everything is moving back to the factory. If you do not own the factory, in some sense, just the erosion of margin that's happening online because of competition will mean that you won't last long. So you yeah. need to be the manufacturer for sure for this business model in the long run. You need to own the manufacturing, but like you said, probably start it for eight months, work with a third party, figure out what margin you get. But in the long run, to get the true long-term sustainable margin for this business, you need to have the ability to customize. The difficulty you're going to have is you won't be able to have the manufacturing in each of the countries. So you're probably going to need a manufacturer in India, a manufacturer in Australia, a manufacturer in Singapore, and all of that, unless you're going to do cross-border ship from India. Yeah. I think it could be possible. Maybe not, because you're going to do print on demand. That yeah. being said, I have seen a trend. I'm not sure if on Amazon. Do you, do you know what Timu is? Timu might be coming back to India eventually. Timu, what do you mean? Timu is, is from Pidudo in China. They, they basically ship uh, okay, Timu products from China direct from the manufacturer's door to the, the seller. It's like Shein uh, for clothing, but Timu is for household goods. Essentially, what I'm trying to get at is that customers in the West these days, so customers in the US are willing to wait eight to 10 days for the yes. products fly from yeah. China. Yeah. Rather than what they used to say is, oh, it's on Prime. I want it delivered in two hours. They would rather the cheaper product yes. than flies for eight days yes. uh, because of the cost of living crisis. So for you, there's a few things to consider. One is the SKUs you're going to manage, who are the designers you're going to get, and what's the revenue model for them. But the main thing is how do you get the cheapest possible manufacturing and mm -hmm. mark up the price so that you make a decent margin on it, let's say 25, 30%. Wow, this is really awesome. So I really want to address these points first. I'm really sort of sorry for taking the time, guys. I'm really sorry. Point one, I'm into cinema. I've been working in cinema from my college days. Yeah, yes. We're, we're a bit of a time, unfortunately. We might need a wrap it there. Jerry, do you have like the question we put it on this call away? Yeah, definitely. Drop, I'll, I'll drop this messages on my account. Yeah. I'll connect you to actually a good friend of mine in China. He's a Canadian Indian. Canadian Thank you so Indian, much. Thank he, you he so does, much, Rob. He does, uh, what you do, but in China. Okay. Well. Yeah. That would be really, really beneficial. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you so much, Rishi. Thank you so much, Kushal. I have, I had a really great time. Thank you so much. I'll drop everything on my chat. Please do check it out. Sounds good to me. Uh, thank you. So, thank you so much. Yeah, great. yeah thanks so much, everyone. I think that that'll be a wrap for the MA. I'll come back over to, to Richie for this, some questions about Dana and stuff. Thanks so much, Kushal, for taking the time, mate. Eh? I was currently on the in a cafe in Paris. So, like, Richie's running the call because my connection is not just Benny. But no, thanks so much for taking the time. I think they will go to some value. Very industry specific questions. Um, I think, like, a lot of folks working on Gomez, sir. Yeah, actually, uh, those uh, are great. 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 Yeah, so it's actually a surprise for me as well. One, and just for everyone on the call, I think what Rob and Rishi are, are building is super useful. It's a different approach, and, and I, I think it's going to benefit a, a lot of you. But two, yeah, I didn't expect as many e uh, founders as well. I know there are. For those who are, I, it's a knowledge space of mine, and, and I've been working here for the last seven, eight years now. So it's something that I'm knowledgeable in and can always help on. For the rest, for sure, any questions? I think Rob mentioned the WhatsApp, just shoot them across. Have the help and, and see you guys on, on the next one that the team organizes. Thank you so much for your time, Kushal. This has been a very insightful session. Hope everyone got tons of value because I personally did. Yeah, after post the AM call, uh, I'll be taking up questions on the program. If any of you have any questions regarding what we're trying to achieve with Patina, what the program structure looks like, um, feel free to ask those questions. And we'll take it over from there. Rob, question, feel free to drop off if you'd like to. Actually, I'm going to stay on just to leave. Right. But... <laughs> I'll be here. All right. The Thank you. Now. Thanks. Cool. All right. So opening the queue for questions regarding the program. If you have any, I'll be happy to answer them. Starting off with, I think you're speaking on mute. My intro. One way. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. What is the role of ONDC in India? If you will make a super app, whatever. Okay, but ONDC platform, Mohit sir asked you about the super app for e-commerce aggregator. So what is the ONDC role? 
O and DC, Open Digital Network Commerce. Oh, you are asking to me, Mahendra? Yes, sir. Sure, right, take over. Again, just give me one second. Okay, just for everyone else, we're open to questions regarding the program, questions regarding your business. Keep it for chat. We'll take it over on Discord and WhatsApp next. Okay. Now I can explain you. Sorry, I got an urgent phone call. I have a meeting. It okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you were asking about ONDC. Now, is a backend network, not a platform. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, they are live from December 2021. But I am living in a metro city, capital of India. I still, I haven't used it. So, I don't know where they are taking it. They are also integrating mutual funds, insurance and other services on it. Which, uh, right now, I can't understand why they are doing this. And the second is they don't uh, have built anything to maintain the user experience. They, they What they are doing is just think like UPI. But what is UPI is a center part UPI. One party is uh, receiving bank and the other party is sending bank. That's it. Uh, and it's oh, a okay. uh, digital project. You're transferring money and th there is nothing that can happen to it. If it fails, it's successful. That's it. But we oh, okay. are very multiple partners involved. Like one is obviously ONDC in the middle. When the seller app, it either can be Amazon or Flipkart. Then the buyer's app, Amazon, Flipkart, anything like it's like someone listed the product on Paytm and someone is buying from Amazon. Yeah. First is payment, then delivery partner. And what, uh, like, and they are saying we will charge 175% uh, less commission than others. Yeah. So the point is where. Uh, guys, Amazon... we, we have a focus group for um, oh, your things so to discuss. Um, so we might jump to that in about two minutes. Richard, did you want to give like just a two minute overview of the program for like the new yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the people who are, who are new uh, this week? And then we'll jump to like focus group up to that. Got it. Oh, hi. hi, Rob, by the way. Hi. Hello, hello. And uh, I have another question also in Ahmedabad. Mahindra, one sec. Um, we'll take your questions in the focus group session. Give me two minutes to explain um, what the program is to all the new folks here. And then we'll move on to focus groups. All right. Cool. All right. So for the rest of you guys, if you have any questions, we know firstly, we host introduction calls every Monday and Wednesday. It's available on four slots. So you'll get, if you want specific questions about what the program is, what we're trying to offer, feel free to join any of those calls and we'll give you elaborate answers as to whatever you're looking for out of this program and what we are looking to provide. But from for a brief introduction what we're trying to do from our end is create more entrepreneurs mostly what we've seen people hesitate in taking the jump from their careers from their education etc to moving on to entrepreneurship and what we've realized is the econ economy needs more entrepreneurs so we want to help with that we want to help you achieve a couple of critical things required for every founder right Firstly, the most common thing that we get is, hey, I need funding. I want to be secure. I want to have some kind of a backup for being able to work on my projects. So that's one of the things that we're looking to provide. Specific details available on the website as well as on the guidebook. I'll share that post this call. Secondly, availability of mentors. So like today, we had Kushal on the call. We have Rob, who is the host of the program. We have more such founders, CEOs, VCs available who will be joining every now and then. We host these calls every week, Tuesdays, 5 to 5.30 as the starting time, India time. So feel free to join that. Thirdly, this is a community-based approach. So you'll get access to peers. It's not a cohort-based approach, which is a common misconception. Cohorts would certainly be, would generally be comprising of a small group of people, but what we want to do is put you together with more like-minded folks, people who's either, who are either looking to make the jump towards entrepreneurship or have already made that jump and are looking to grow it for. So these are a couple of things that we want to tackle with this program. There are two aspects to it. So like I mentioned, firstly, the community aspects. We have a couple of tasks related to the community aspect where as and when you complete those tasks, we have cash rewards available for you on completing those. That's the first thing, right? Worry not because all of these tasks are related to help you building your startup forward. And I'm pretty sure we've been into 
building contact out for almost nine years now and we've, we're still continuing on all these tasks. So hopefully as and when you get to do those, you benefit out, right? Once you complete those tasks, we will move you on to our residency program, which lasts for a period of six months. You will get paid about 10 to 20K USD for 5 to 10% equity from your company. The specifics of that can be discussed when you move on to your uh, residency program. And in this residency program, the payouts will be provided to you in three tranches. First up, once you get into the residency program, and then the others will be in two months each. That's a quick introduction of what we're trying to do. Are there any questions that I can help answer? I'm just lowering everyone's hand for now because I believe most of you sure. started that uh, when we were getting the AMA questions answered for all. Kushan, sure. I'm just one some time. Uh, I think we jumped to the folks groups and then uh, the questions we can ask them for to, to workshop. Can do that as well. All right. So feel free to reach out to me, guys. We'll keep the rest of the session to the focus group. A quick brief on what the focus group is. I'll jump into each of your groups and talk about it more. But basically what we're looking to do is I'll put you into groups of six to eight people. Discuss your challenges across each other. What my and Amoyth um, were doing with theirs. This will help you A, with networking. B, with getting knowledge from each other. And three, just building your suck. Right? So I'll open up these. We'll run it for the next 30 minutes and then we'll come to the main call and have a closing. Sounds all right. Give me a thumbs up the reaction if that's all right. All right. So give me just one minute and I'll start the breakout. Breakout room will automatically end after 30 minutes and the room should be open now. You should see a notification on your screen. Accept the notification. We'll go and breakout rooms. And the team will jump into each of those, trying to help answer questions, if any. The main agenda there is to discuss your biggest challenge across your peers. For those of you who are still on the main rule, are you still in the call? Did you not get a notification to join a breakout room? Victor, Satya, Rostel, and friend. You've all been assigned a breakout room. Please join those. If you're still on the main call, I am going to assume that you're not yours. Hello, Rishi. Uh, actually, I'm leaving early today. I have a meeting at 7. No worries. Go ahead. Uh, and I want to ask you, I got my first validation today, right? Four more to go. If it's not. Yes. You say yes, right? I have to get four more, right? Ideally, try to get a recording of these and share the recording with this for this call on Discord. Actually, it's on record is a little bit tough. Like right? the major problem I'm facing right now is the the problem I'm facing right now is something like there are it's very early stage in India and there are very less people who had worked in it, but there are similar industries whom I can talk. But getting them on call and recording them, especially for LinkedIn, is a little bit hard for me. Why do you say so? Getting in uh, the Google Meet is hard. I can get the reviews through messages or on call. My maybe I will try my best. No, no one. There are a lot of platforms available for you to make use of this. One such is Intro.io. Intro.co or I O. I'm not sure about that. Just okay, like, okay, let me uh, note right now. So there is ADP list, and there's of course LinkedIn for you to reach out to, uh, reach out to other people and ask them for their time. But it's. Having said that, it is a difficult task. But no, getting feedback is not hard. Getting them on video call and getting permission that I can record it or not is a difficult. Fair enough. How about you try getting their feedback, putting it up on a write-up and sharing that if a recording yes, is possible. possible. Like convincing them that I'm recording this and can I give it to other? Like I have to ask them before sharing the recording. It's privately shared. We're not going to be sharing it with the public or the entire... Okay, so it will not be published. Uh, yeah, but they will get notified now. Nah, yeah, I am recording it. Yeah, definitely. I'm just take Most mentors who we've spoken to don't have a problem recording because we just tell them that we want to share this knowledge across with our team, right? And they're pretty open to that. Uh, try that out. I think that would make, be useful. And I completed my one case study on my computer. You heard about it. I, I know you, uh, Tata knew you. Yes. 
Hi Shabam, were you not assigned a breakout room? I have a time with the breakout room. I am not getting the, you know, why that thing number. Try joining in again, I'll join your room with you. Hey, how are you on call? Guys, Sharon Muskan, I'll put you in. Then just feel free to jump around breakout rooms and see if the conversation is going on. You're a co-host, so you should be able to join any breakout rooms. Just jump into room number one. Yeah, hi Mahindra, any, are you still on call? You are speaking on mute. We have only two. Sorry? We have only two here. Come back. You can go into a breakout room and you left the breakout room. Okay. Do you see a notification on your top bar to join a breakout room? No. No. You should be one. Tap, sorry, tap to join breakout three. Okay, Sai, are you joining the call now? Or did you jump out of a breakout room? There was this network issue for my end, so I had to connect. No, I just this be pouring in from their breakout rooms now. All right, welcome back, guys. I hope the breakout rooms were good enough for you to discuss, network, and share learnings and challenges with each other. Do you think 30 minutes is enough, or would you like some more time next week? I think some more discussion. Yeah, in 45 minutes, it's good. Cool. All right. Because our AMA extended a little bit longer than we expected. Otherwise, the idea was to keep it at 45. That's exactly what we did last week, too. But, all right. What do you guys think about the AMA session? Um, valuable? Article? Yes. It was very, very valuable. No, it was very good. You have a good rest of your day. As most of the details related to the program, if you have any more questions related to the program, visit our Luma calendar again. We have introduction calls scheduled across the month. Feel free to join them and we'll help answer any questions that you might have. Well, she just one doubt ahead. So I see that there are multiple sessions for interaction with the founders, right? Do we need to join every one of them or it's you join one and then introduce and then interview? All right. That's a good question. These calls are for introducing what the program is, what it does, what we are trying to do from our side. So joining one of them should be enough because there will be repeated information being passed around, around in each of these. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, so just maybe drop into one of those and ask if any questions that you might have regarding the program and then you can skip the rest of them and continue continue on with the mentorship call that we host on a weekly basis. I have one. About these tasks that we have listed out here. So where do we have to post about them? Can you tell me more about this? If you have done something or if we are about to do something, where do we update you guys on this? So... Two parts. I'll answer that question in two parts. Firstly, we highly encourage building in public. We've seen tremendous results from it on our personal company. So we've been building contact out for nine years now. And since we started building in public, posting our progress or posting our goals on social media, we've seen it generate a lot of revenue and drive a lot of customers. So that's one part of it. You can post on social media. Feel free to tag us so that we can share it along with our network and get you more uh, networking opportunities, more used to what you're doing, and other potential customers in a sense. Second thing, you can also share them on Discord. So post your weekly goals on Discord on the goals channel and make sure to add the task resources there. So let's say if you have spoken to two mentors or you've spoken to two potential customers, if you have recordings or write-ups of those, Tag them in your goals post and share them across with us. Sure, sure. This answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Cool. All right. Anybody else got any questions? We've got five minutes. So I'm happy to answer any of those. 
Yes, I just wanted to add friend to receiving invitation every week for these mentorship sessions. Well, we just have to keep signing up every week. A lot of background noise on each of your call, if your mics, so if you could mute the bells and let the person speaking speak, that would be very helpful. Answering your uh, question, Agbo, one, you can sign up to our Luma calendar. There's an option to subscribe so that you get automated notifications every time we add a new mentorship session or a call to our calendar. Secondly, I will also be sending out invites to everyone who's attended any event with us so that you keep getting updated on a personal level as an question. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Lovely. Yes, Mahindra. Sir, can you give me one was pro tem email ID? One was pro tem to look at the sheets that I shared. I think they have added their details there. I'll put one again if you guys want to add your details. Uh, give me one second. I want the contact detail of Manish Protein Bora. Cool. Check the sheet in the chat. All right. Any other questions from the rest of you guys? I had a question in one of the breakout room. That was that if we are going to do more in-person events. So for everyone, we have not started on them yet. We do plan to introduce more in-person events once we have more people joining from the same region to us. We see and then organize something for you guys. For now, we do encourage members and all the participants to arrange meetups among yourself. So if you find people who are at the same region as yourself, I can go ahead and plan a meetup and maybe select one destination that you all want to meet. To facilitate this better, what I can do is share a message on Discord and you guys can share your location within that one message so that you can talk amongst yourself and maybe do a meetup if you want to. Yep. So two things there. WhatsApp and Discord, you guys have access to each other's contact details. If you're in the same city, feel free to host meetups yourself. What we are trying to do from our end in the long term is host meetups because there's only so much we can do on these video calls, right? We have two hours with each other and we have to go through mentorship. We have to go through AME, focus groups. So you might, might come to a point where you'll not get a chance to express yourself fully. So to promote that, we want you to meet in person. If you're in the same city, if you're in the same vicinity, reach out to each other and feel free to host this. Yeah, just one suggestion to see. So that sheet that you have shared, right? Maybe if you can add the location as well in there so that people can add that. Yeah. Definitely. Keep right, so one, we'll do that for the time being. What you can do is they have their LinkedIn URLs posted there. So just maybe look at the location mentioned there. But thanks for the suggestion. We'll add another location column over there. Uh, Rishi, can you share the WhatsApp group North in? Cool. So I'm your, you're a first time attendee for the yeah. call? Yes. Good. All right. Which means that your application is under review or you've attended one of the introduction calls, right? Yeah. This is the first Good. time I've attended. So I'll be sending over instructions on the, with a guidebook as to what you're supposed to do. And those will have links to join the Discord as well as the WhatsApp groups. Uh, okay. You'll receive them in maybe two days. Okay, fine. Yeah. You have the mail right there? Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. Last bit, last question, anyone? Can I? Yeah, please, go ahead. When we are in the breakout session, actually, Serena was about to speak something and uh, we have to come back here. Can she finish? What is, was she from Robert's advice or tell something? Oh, no, actually, I was just going to remind everyone the, the session is going to be ending soon. Feel free to just wait. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask uh, after the breakout session. Yeah, that's it. And I wish you one more thing. I am for the time attending this session. If you can connect with your WhatsApp group and if there is any more thing in your offer. All of those who are attending this the first time, if you filled out the application form, please give us some time to review those application forms and we'll reach out back to you. If you've not filled out the application form yet, I'll ID encourage you to do that. Go over our website, athena.vc. Most of the details are mentioned there and technically you should fill out the application form there because if you don't do that, everything else is moot point. So start there and then we'll take it over. There is one last question I have. So I see that it is mentioned in that guidebook that I have to add all the, all my responses in the form to the Discord, right? So is there a way I access that form that I have filled earlier? Or Okay, let me look that up. Maybe you could reach out to me on LinkedIn. 
if you don't have your form and i'll try to search it up and send it over definitely yeah i'll ping you thank you use any of these platforms right use linkedin or discord to reach out to me and i'll or even email and i'll find your forms and send it over to you you can also reach out to siren muskan tanya anyone from our team and we'll help sure thank you all right guys i guess time for today thank you so much for attending the session we'll see you again next week hopefully see as members third whatsapp groups have a good rest of your and build thank you